supplies. Today we've got this Agilent 8960 communications test set to take apart. Thanks very much to Lewis for sending me this. He bought it a while ago because it was cheap and looked interesting but turned out to um, not be very useful so he donated it to uh, be taken to bits. Now this is a sort of originally a pretty expensive piece of kit. It's designed for things like production line testing of mobile phones and cellular modems and yeah, um, certification development of um, phones. It's got loads and loads and loads of options for all the different protocols, lots of different software packages that um, you can buy for it and they need yeah, different hardware options depending on the protocol. It's actually been around for a while. It's, I think it it actually was originally a Hewlett Packard instrument and it is still listed on the Keysight website although it's not sold in Europe because of the um, stupid lead free um, RHS stuff but uh, because it's so specialist although sort of very expensive it's actually pretty useless for anything else it's got all the you know the RF goodies it's got signal generators it's probably got capability to be a spectrum analyzer on a power meter but the problem is that um, there's no user interface. Um, I say the, the user interface will depend very much on what applications are running on this, but this particular one, there's literally nothing you can really do. There's a calibrate facility, um, none of the buttons seem to do anything. You can go into like a, a configuration menu and it's just got some very basic setup stuff, but um, I've not sort of been able to see any way to get this to do anything at all useful even you know I've put my spectrum analyzer on the output I can't get any output um, I think you know the, the idea behind this is this is meant to sort of basically pretend to be a, a base station that you plug a phone in but I'm not even seeing any signals coming out of that and the, there are a few um, bits of test software and so on on the um, Keysight website the problem is the only way to get software onto this is through the GPIB port as far as I can tell and I don't have a GPIB interface so um, uh, I can't really play around with that and I don't think it's sufficiently interesting to um, do anything more on that so um, obviously this is going to have lots of uh, very high quality RF goodness in there, you know, crap loads of shielding, lots of signal processing to generate all the different sort of protocols so there's probably going to be some um, FPGAs, maybe some DSP stuff in there so uh, it's very hard to figure out what the original cost of this was because so there are so many options but I'm sure it will be easily into five figures if anyone's actually ever bought one of these or been involved, um, I'd be interested to know what sort of costs were involved. But these are, because these aren't that useful, they they are going very cheap. I mean, there's a fee on eBay for low hundreds of dollars. I think there's actually even one that's under a hundred dollars. This has been manufactured over quite a long period, so there's lots of different versions, lots of options. So almost any one of these you find could well be configured completely differently. This had a, uh, um, a safety test sticker dated uh, 2012, so this was last used about um, five years ago and there's a calibration sticker calibration due 2012 as well so this is clearly being used up to about then to the actual software I think there's a bit of information in here that actually says application selection oh, F10 this all applications um, yeah so G GSM GPRS RF modem so yes yeah, basically it's all sort of G GPR GSM it's all pretty much got the same um, order code E6590 as far as I, I, I can guess, this is presumed because there's really, yeah, apart from a calibrate thing, there's no sort of, you know, press button to start type thing. So I'm guessing this is maybe sitting there pretending to be a, uh, a cell site, although so I couldn't actually detect anything coming out. It could, of course, be it's faulty. And the other thing is, even if this was d did do something, you almost certainly need a special test sim in the in the uh, modem or phone to tell it what channels to look at and um, all the various sort of network IDs and so on. So even if this, this was working, pretending to be a cell site, it probably wouldn't be possible to communicate with it without that. That special test sim um, either so there's not really any serious scope for doing anything with this so um, I think we need to uh, just take it apart and see what's inside it. Um, lots of connectors on the back we've got a digital bus um, looking at the connector inside this appears to be quite a high speed thing so this may be to do with generating real-time data um, to send over the, um, the modem link um, couldn't immediately find any information on that. This cable just this just links the front panel Cat5 socket to the internal LAN port, so you can have Ethernet on the front or the back. VGA out for an external monitor, various other remote control, external interface control, signal generator, baseband I.O. again for presumably um, to talk to the various modulators, there's three serial ports, a couple of other things like test set um, and various coax counter in, frequency references in out, and there's of course GPIB. Interesting that GPIB still actually got its uh, condom on the cover so I wonder if that's ever actually been used. You see we've got this huge card cage just full of boards 
again there's lots of different options on here so yeah some of these will be op plug-in options for example there's some protocols that say like that you need two signal generators and i'm sure there's all sorts of other differences and variants depending on exactly what you want lots of um shielded rf boxes and the bottom here there's a big shielded section that um, has got the front panel rf connectors on it a few bits of ribbon cable connecting these and also the um, display and front panel there a couple of what i'm guessing are rf attenuators with sort of this hard line sort of solid coax connecting to it and on this side we've got the uh, power supply back here a couple of big fans they sort of blow air across all this uh, card cage. I'm sure it flows the air through the air through the power supply as well. And if you'll notice on here, there's a few names, and if these are sort of product codes, we've got Steve, Annie, and Alison. Um, there's a few cables here going to the back panel. This digital connector has these high-speed connectors. So this is clearly a sort of high, some sort of high-speed parallel interface it's got these sort of slightly weird looking um, cables so these are probably differential high speed uh, links for some external bit of hardware the, the basic hardware on this is sort of fairly old so for example there's no sign of usb anywhere so i guess this is sort of thing that nowadays would probably be done over like one gig ethernet but this probably predates that using high speed parallel or perhaps there was some other piece of instrument that already there they they wanted to interface to and the back panel actually plugs onto the uh the back plane board at the bottom. So you can use a couple of these um, these big multi-pin connectors that plug straight onto the um, the back plane. And there's the, this is the uh, reference oscillator module that we saw the adjustment for on the back. All right. So before I uh, start completely ripping this apart, I just. Um, took the back panel off just so I can measure the supply voltages for this oscillator module so when you've got a big piece of kit like this that might have useful modules it's always worth just just uh, you know firing up measure any power supply voltage because I couldn't immediately find any da data on this one well, thing I did fa find is there's a 15 volt supply on here which is still active when the thing is powered down um, so I'm guessing this is probably an oven controlled oscillator and that's keeping the um, supply on so that, so that the oven can be uh, kept at working temperature for maximum stability this is quite common on high-end RF stuff in that even when it's switched off the oscillators kept running just for maximum stability and to avoid any warm-up time when you first turn it on and also on the back panel is the hard disk this is a 20 gig two and a half inch drive and a uh, rather elaborate sort of vibration proof sort of shock mount um, nothing especially interesting on this back panel there's a few option dip switch this seems to, dip, to be to do with the um, LAN connection there's a couple of serial uh, options there and it's but other than that it's just the connectors we can see this high speed connector with its uh, wibbly wobbly um, differential tracks there these which I'd imagine these are all probably just transient protectors of some sort and again on the back of this it's just mostly just high own protection sort of loads of these SOT23s which I'm sure just be like TVS diodes there's a little um, E squared down here 93C46 which is probably like instrument serial number and maybe some licensing information and there's a little connector next to it to allow it to be um, externally programmed okay I've uh, taken all the boards out now we'll take a look at those um, a little bit later so the back this is um, one back plane uh, I believe this is a VME bus and um, something I noticed I hadn't seen before are these. These are DIN 41612 connectors, but they've been extended with contacts either side. I think this is, I believe this is um, to extend VME, VME bus from 32 to 64 bits. Um, it's quite a clever way of doing it actually, because it doesn't change the shell size. So it's basically compatible both ways in that these connectors will plug into a standard connector and also a standard connector will plug into a backplane connection, the backplane um, connectors as well. So it's quite a neat way of providing sort of two ways backwards compatible solution to an existing connector type. And you see the, uh, at the end they've got long, long um, pins there so that the ground always contacts first. And um, that's designed for applications where they can actually be plugged in under power and also to, to reduce the risk of um, ESD damage. The um, the standard 41612 doesn't doesn't do that it doesn't have these extended things well i've got a feeling i've seen 41612s that do have different length pins but on the 41612 
isn't a standard, but you know, it's a standard connector, but it isn't like a standard bus with a standard pin. Obviously, there are some standard buses like VME that use it. Whereas, obviously, I think this connector is a more specifically VME bus, so they've actually committed these to be um, grounds on the outside. VME is a, a very old standard. It's uh, very common for like a lot, you know, industrial type and professional type u uses. There's uh, zillions of VME boards. It's sort of, I think, dates from well before you know, any PC architectures, and it's sort of quite common in industrial type systems. Um, not really a great deal on this board. One interesting thing is there's two bus bar connectors from the power supply. We've got five volts and three, but we don't have a specific ground connector. They must be using the case as ground, which uh, is a bit unusual. And you, you sometimes actually want to separate chassis ground from signal ground for EMC, but I think on an RF product they tend to bond it all together. But it's uh, a little bit surprising. They yeah they're relying on the um, the mechanical screw connections rather than here having a dedicated um, ground tab on there. Um, there's very little um, else on here, there's some sort of a uh, load of these resistor packs which I'm sure will be uh, bus termination type resistors. And there's two chips on here, there's uh, an AMI chip, now there's quite a few of these dotted around the system and I can't find any information on them. Um, there's a few of the specific ones but there's a few other AMA chi AMI chips with similar looking part numbers in different packages. I suspect that either something sort of specific to VME bus or there could be some sort of clock distribution chip. Um, AMI got bought out by OnSemi so the old website's not there anymore so a lot of the old data seems to have disappeared and there's literally almost no trace of them um, on the net anywhere. So uh, interesting, there is um, a little header next to that one which suggests maybe there's some sort of um, programmable uh, aspect to that. Perhaps it's some sort of programmable clock generator or something, but uh, if anyone knows, um, please leave it in the comments. There's also an E squared problem in here again, that that's probably just ID identifying the type of um, hardware so that because this thing's got loads of different you know, versions and different software versions, it's probably there you know, just so that the software, the software can figure out what, what hardware it's running on. Um, inside here we've got the power supply area. There's two um, switch mode power supplies in this unit and then at the bottom there's this board which most of the power supply connectors come into. There's actually quite a lot of um, HC CMOS in there. I'm not quite sure what that would be doing unless it's to do with perhaps sequencing or something. Um, and these are the two sort of bus bar connectors and the um, the negative supply from the rail right from the supply does go down to this, this chassis tag so they are actually using the ground the chassis to um, for the uh, ground to the main board um, something I noticed on here they've got um, some markings saying install this screw second and install this screw first now I'm guessing this is to do with getting the um, getting these bus bars lined up and um, avoiding any unnecessary stress. There's also a note here saying see service stop before installing power supply. So I think that's probably just about making sure that you, you these are all done in the right order because if you tighten up from the wrong order you could end up with some either just not being able to get this tightened up at all or just it having too many, you know, some residual stresses that might cause problems uh, long term. So I think you probably sort of start off by tightening up the bus bars and then sort of tighten it up sort of from this direction working outwards to make sure that you've not got any um, stresses set up in, in anywhere. And in fact that, that the, uh, the first screw hole is actually slightly smaller than the uh, second one so it's a bit more, yeah, they've got the, the, the t when you're doing something like this it's quite important to you know, figure out where, the, where your tolerances are. So you've got tight tolerances on this end and then any um, variation is taken up by the end that doesn't matter so much for precise alignment. These are the two main power supplies. First one, this mostly supplies the uh, 5 volt and um, logic supplies. This is a, uh, a lambda modular supply. It's, um, 5 volts at 35 amps, 12 at 8 amps and then two modules 10 and 12.1 volts at 8 amps. And this looks like one of these sort of power supplies that are customised at a fairly late stage in manufacture, these sort of modules screw in and um, the secondary, it looks like the secondaries are actually made out of PCB. Now unlike the other, the other Lambda modular ones where we saw where they actually had a flex coming from the output module that just goes into the transformer, it looks like these are actually soldered into the main board so I'm getting yeah, these these take a bit more customization. Again, yeah, this will be done at the factory or distributor, local distributor, not uh, not by the end user. Um, but this transformer assembly looks like it's actually clipped together. So I think what happens is that the uh, 
these PCBs get populated into the main PCB, soldered in, and then the whole transformer clamped down and the modules fitted and adjusted so they can be customised at a fairly late stage in uh, manufacture. And uh, this is the other supply. This is actually labelled Agilent, whether, whether it's actually ma manufactured by them or just made by a subcontractor and badged with their name, I don't know. It's um, made in Korea, so I don't know if Agilent has a, had a uh, Korean power supply division. And this has got uh, quite a big range of outputs. There's sort of plus minus several plus minus 15s, plus 9, minus 5.2, plus 3.4. Yeah, have got eight different supply rails, so this has obviously uh, been customised to the requirements of uh, this instrument. As it's noticeable on the output, and all the outputs they've got sort of um, inductor capacitor, another inductor, another capacitor, and quite a lot of ceramics as well. So this is clearly designed to be a sort of a very low noise supply. So yeah, this is mostly supplying the um, the RF and analog section. So this has clearly been customised a to provide all the different voltages, but b to meet um, some uh, pretty tight noise specs and this is the back of the front panel area just where the ribbon cables unplugged there's the uh, keyboard PCB with the encoder there's the front panel BNC's the front panel Ethernet you see they've gone to all these uh, trouble of doing all these different color coax cables and they've also printed the front panels to um, which ones go where there's the uh, display interface board that transitions from the ribbon cable to the um, actual connector onto the back of the LCD. There's a connector there that goes down to the inverter for the CCFL backlight. The whole construction of this front, front panel is sort of pretty complicated. The sort of pretty uh, intricate set of brackets holding the uh, display in place. The actual front panel PCB has got an additional sort of metal stiffening plate here and there's some additional um, shielding here but there's also around the display here it looks like there's um there's this extra plate so I suspect that this window might actually have a conductive layer in it and this is um, providing bonding to that because again yeah they want to keep this thing quiet as quiet as possible from the RF um, point of view Obviously this uh, window is potentially a big sort of window emitting stuff. Yes, I thought the, the, this is sort of providing um, an all-round contact to the, uh, the uh, looks like there's a conductive ink on here. It's quite hard to see but there is actually a visible mesh over this entire window. I'm not sure if it's a sort of wire or whether it's just maybe a printed conductive ink sort of printed mesh but it's, uh, it's very small perhaps something like about a sort of half a millimeter pitch and it's um and it's sort of diagonally orientated so that you know, the it's sort of that it's sort of oriented in this direction so presumably that's to avoid pr producing sort of fringing effects with the pixels of the lcd and it's actually made up of uh, quite a few different layers but this um this seems to be a lot of that it's actually got the conductive uh, grid printed on it and it's sort of fairly low that must be a metallic coating to be that low so it's probably a silver coating but it looks quite black so maybe they've added some ink just to make it less uh, less shiny and uh, more transparent and even more complications of front panels this plastic trim with um, copper shielding coating on there and this is the PCB that does all the buttons around the screen so these are the standard membrane buttons and the, the PCB for these buttons is quite a thin PCB but they've got some extra shielding can over there just to shield the back of this connector which uh, seems rather over the top. Surprisingly there wasn't a, a, like a ferrite bead around here. That's, yeah, normally you see um, sort of chunk, yeah, chunky ferrite uh, filters around ribbon cables to front panels. But the other surprising thing is you, you've got the gold plating for the switches which is what you'd expect but they've been quite extravagant. Normally you'd have solder resist over the, the rest of the section. They just uh, gold plated both sides of the PCB for no real obvious reason. Yeah, I'm not even sure if it's to get a, an earth bond to the, the back. Because it might be. Yeah, actually yes, looking at this there's, um, there's some cutouts here which correspond to the, the vias 
on the board. It's not, it must be a four layer board as well. So I think, yeah, maybe this back is, back is actually to make um, good grounding contact. So again, they're being uh, ultra paranoid about uh, RF. And of course, this is yeah, way beyond what you'd need for any C marking FCC. This is, you know, obviously this is an RF test instrument, so you don't really want it kicking out RF, interfering with the thing you're, uh, you're trying to test. Right, at the bottom section we've got this um, big RF front end module with the two end connectors out the front and they actually go into uh, some more hardline coax to the uh, PCB inside and there's these two uh, identical um, attenuator models these are marked labeled with three gigahertz attenuator and again they've uh, actually gone to the trouble of printing legends about sort of which, which things go where all the uh, colored coaxes so this is all the uh, backplane stuff uh, taking out the chassis there's the uh, um, digital backplane. Um, there's this little riser board. The only things on there again. There's an E squared prom on here. They've used a through hole on here because everything else on this board through holes, no surface mount at all. Um, these are the connectors for like things like display at the front and front panel boards. And then this is the RF backplane again. There's nothing really on here apart from filtering. There's some uh, uh, filters for the power supply, filters for the front panel BNC connectors. Again, the ID E squared prom and just connectors. Um, so just out of curiosity, I read some of these E-squared problems from the various boards and as I thought they basically just contain what I expected serial number, the same as, as on the serial number label and also just a description. So let's take a look at this RF front end unit. We've got the uh, input connectors going via this hardline coax. Actually that provides a certain amount of mechanical decoupling of the connector from the um, PCB. And they go onto this bottom board and there's a, obviously another cover over here with an RF gasket. So this is just sort of the, uh, like the input and some switching. The, um, this is an, in, in an input and output connector. This is output only. First it goes through this thing, which I'm guessing may be some sort of protection device because it's not connected to anything else. And then we've got a couple of uh, these Teledyne RF relays. Incidentally, the, the frequency range of this thing was about 300 meg to 2.5 gig depending on which options we use. So it's not like super crazy high frequency, only up to two and a half gig. Um, a few other things, there's some um, gallium arsen arsenide switches, high frequency switching devices, a few uh, inductors, not really a lot else, there's just a few uh, filters. Yeah, so this is just switching uh, some of these uh, connectors that go off to the various other module. In fact, these are labelled receiver one out, receiver two out, S1 in, S2 in, power debt out, power detect source out, RF in out. It looks like it's on a slightly exotic material, it's like a light coloured material, so that's probably some uh, RF friendly uh, substrate, it's about one mil thick. And these are what these relays look like inside. It's sort of designed for very low um, stray capacitance and uh, sort of reasonably consistent impedance. So you can see the uh, the contact just flips between two short wires that are welded directly to the uh, pins. And now the main unit. With a RF gasket. Also, I'm guessing that's maybe some sort of RF absorption, absorbing material, just to avoid the sort of the signal bouncing around inside that cavity. Uh, it is, it is, it is sort of magnetic. So yeah, it's probably some sort of ferrite. It's slightly soft. So it's probably a ferrite-loaded sort of rubber material that they just stick on there to soak up the RF. And as usual for uh, RF things, it's all sort of sectioned off into various. Uh, departments. Uh, this central area here has got a slightly darkened PCB so this looks like it's sort of maybe got a bit hot so perhaps this is a power amplifier of some sort. And this bit next to this actually had a couple of metal uh, clamps around it so that's probably heat sinking. The uh, IO section is just a big row of filters, power supply filters. A couple of these um, AMI chips, so these are used all over the place in this thing. They're marked um, uh, 1H21-4429 IO chip. So 
I, I'm thinking those are maybe some sort of bus interface. There's perhaps some sort of common bus running across all these boards, and then this provides I/O from that bus for each um, peripheral. But there's a lot of these, so uh, I think that must be what they are. Obviously, the fact that they're called I/O chip uh, sort of maybe gives it away. But I've not been able to find any information at all online about those. Uh, up here we've got some AD7545 12-bit D2A converters. A few bits of HC MOSFETs are surprisingly low frequency, 2.45, 75 megahertz oscillator there. A few power transistors. A load more um, op amps and analog stuff down there. And a few bits of ECL and 74F series logic, so that's perhaps a... Um, high frequency sort of frequency counting front end then we've got these uh, sexy gold packages don't recognize that uh, manufacturer's name but these ones are actually got adjuvant on them then next to the this Marcom device that's a um, gallium arsenide switch but they've also got some sort of fairly mundane LM358 op amp next to it and also um, AD822 which is a FET input op amp Again, there's another three, 358 with another one of these Agilent um, gold package devices and some switching. So perhaps that's um, either some sort of power amplifier or maybe power sensing stuff. Outside the board, there's a bunch of resistors around this um, RF section. Some logic, uh, a fairly old, that's an Actel FPGA. It's a fairly old um, FPGA. Guessing it's 05 is a 2005 date code. These were one time programmable devices, and that's obviously not in a socket, so they're obviously a bit of a pain to use if you ever want to reprogram them. Um, just a few sort of analog multiplexers and analog stuff around there. Yeah, and popping the caps off these um, microwave devices shows that yeah, they're actually very simple devices, not much in there, but they're probably sort of gallium arsenide and uh, some funky process to uh, get the RF performance. Let's take a look at this. Um, these attenuators. There's only two identical attenuator modules in here. That's interesting. They're, they're not relays. They're using um, again funky package devices. Probably uh, gallium arsenide. What's rather surprising, though, as an attenuator, they, there, yeah, there isn't any shielding between these sections. You'd expect the attenuator to each section be sort of very carefully shielded to avoid leakage going across it, which is a little bit odd. Another one of these AMI I.O. control chips. There's a GAL, a couple of E squareds, at least one of those I'm guessing will have maybe some calibration data. There's a DAC and a load of op amps and so on, so these things probably need to be biased with exactly the right voltage. And there's some um, op amps here in these sections. Again, this is probably providing buffering and providing the right um, bias voltage to here. Um, again, we've got an RF gasket, a bunch of filters on the digital lines as before on the other board. Nothing really apart from some filters on the other. Pop the uh, the caps off these and uh, these under a microscope. Instantly getting the caps off these devices is really simple. If you just get a bit of um, solder to get a good thermal contact, just put that on the top, let it heat up. Then you can normally just use a knife. The um, the solder they use tends to be fairly hard, but if you mix it up with ordinary sort of soft solder, it tends to soften the. Um, the stuff they've used to put the caps on, you can usually just then get a knife in and uh, take the caps, just slide the cap off. Interestingly, it looks like we've got two different devices, but they're actually using exactly the same die. They're just bonding it differently. Obviously, it makes a lot of sense because of the um, one-off tooling costs for making uh, chips. But uh, so it's interesting. It looks like they've got various parts on there that they've just bonded depending on which ones they actually want to use for this uh, particular application. Right, enough of that RF nonsense for a minute. Take a look at the processor board and some of the other digital boards. So this is actually mounted on a plate. I think this um, processor board looks like it's a, a built-in sort of processor rather than a, an Agilent um, custom device. It's got this uh, sub board plugged onto it. Yeah, this is a, an Agilent board. It's got the uh, got an LCD controller on it. And uh, this is an MP9914, which I believe is a GPIB controller for the uh, GPIB IEEE 488 bus on the back. Label device, which is probably a CPLD of some sort. Actually, that's a, um, an FPGA configuration prom. It's probably for this FPGA. This is a Zilink Spartan 2. Interesting that they've got uh, a real mix of FPGAs in here. There's Actel, Altera, 
lattice and xilinx in various parts of it. But obviously some of these boards might be made by different groups and different divisions. So we've got the LCD controller, some RAM. So this is just sort of the odds and ends that are specific peripherals for this uh, device. Whereas this is a um, Motorola VME processor. And it's an, it's an MPC603R, which is a PowerPC processor. And then the sort of the um, chipset to uh, deal with this. So this, this actual um, board is made by Motorola as a sort of an OEM VME bus, sort of general purpose processor. Obviously it's got tons of I.O. It's got these uh, expansions for a, a subboard here. It's got a high speed connector here, another huge rate high speed connector here. It's also got one of these. This is the um, an ST real time clock. It's what they call a snap hat package. Obviously the problem is with real time clock is it needs a battery, but you can't put a battery through reflow process for surface mount. So what they do is the real time clock comes in this package, which is a surface mountable package, but with some battery connections on the top. And then the battery module is then just snapped on afterwards, after the main assembly. So that just clicks on. So that um, gives you a fairly neat, neat way of surface mount assembling. and also makes it easy to replace the battery as well. Um, this is a PCI to VME bus bridge chip. So I'm guessing this is probably going to be a PCI bus. So you can have like PCI peripherals on here. Instantly, uh, that's about 280 quid in DigiKey, that chip. That's the Winbond sort of general purpose I.O. chip. And there's obviously uh, RAM, like some uh, flash ROM here, some sort of BIOS boot up ROM on there. And there's an um, Ethernet interface here, some Ethernet magnetics. What's slightly surprising is that the, um, the hard disk interface isn't on this board, it's on this um, carrier board. You thought sort of general purpose um, processor board would have the um, IDE interface built in, but then obviously they're sort of clearly uh, fairly pushed for space on this thing. Now this is a set of three boards that were um, interconnected by a ribbon cable and also connect to that digital connector on the back. And they also hit LSS, not sure what that stands for. This one's LSS analog, not a huge amount on here. There's, there's a sort of Xilinx CPLD, a whole bunch of analog switches. A uh, high speed IF AZD converter and also a load of um, high speed serializers, sort of converting parallel to serial for um, shoving large amounts of data. So, this maybe is handling some of the low level um, modulation for the uh, some of the cellular protocols. Uh, this is the board that connects to both of those other two boards and also to the um, digital connector on the back panel. So, um, Xilinx Vertex FPGA and again some more of these. Um, serializer chips and this is the one that's uh, doing all the work by the looks of it it's a sub board on here so we've got um that's a integrated power pc processor with an integrated pci bus another one of these pci to vme bus interfaces another small spartan fpga there a bit of flash some ram a load more ram on the other side and then on this subboard, it's FPGA City. Got some uh, couple of XCV800 Vertex devices, an XCV300, and a um, Spartan 2S50. Some RAM, also some more sort of serializers, and some other chips. That actually, helpfully actually tell you, made by a company called Grey Chip Digital Filter, the Xilinx CPLD. So that's obviously clearly doing. Um, massive amounts of processing again probably generating all the um, low level protocol for the uh, various cellular protocols and these are but these xcv 800 these are although they're, they're obsolete they're um, 800,000 gate FPGA so these are like big expensive uh, FPGAs right this board's actually labeled DSP but it doesn't actually have a DSP as such on it there's um Xilinx Vertex XCV50 and there's another sort of off-the-shelf computing module. Um, this this obviously got a footprint for um, PC104, which is basically the ISA bus for industrial. But this is actually um, PC104 Plus, which actually adds a PCI bus. You can get modules that have got both. But this is clearly PCI only. So this is basically a PCI bus embedded PC on here, interfacing to this um, Xilinx FPGA. But so it's presumably doing some sort of uh, DSP operations. This is a sort of pretty packed 
But again, there are loads and loads of these um, around for various sort of industrial PC type applications. They've been around for quite a long time. Underneath the heatsink, which is held on by these sort of soldered in pins, there's an Intel processor and an uh, Intel 82815 memory and um, graphics controller. And this is a, an Intel Pentium 4 1.6 gigahertz processor. Now it's possible that just connecting power up to this you might actually be able to get some um, video and boot. Well, actually it looks like maybe the video section is not populated because there's a 15 pin connector there which obviously con um, corresponds with VGA and there's an unpopulated chip which is probably the video um, DAC. So uh, this one's labelled ADC board. A couple of um, sub boards on here as well. Again, more of these AMI unidentifiable chips, which is a bit annoying. This one just says SCA. Yeah, these, yeah, these are all the same. This is the 1821-2002. Four of those. Got some RAM attached to each one. These ones have. And these have got um, 20 mega sample per second. Um, HD converters attached to them. So I'm guessing maybe this is sort of some sort of bus interface with some local sort of RAM storage so it can sort of acquire data into there and then read it back over the bus at its leisure. But I'd be quite interested to know what all these, these um, yeah, the, the, these AMI chips are clearly a family of some sort of interface because you know, there's a few, about four different types in various parts of the system. I'd be uh, quite interested in find out more information about them. The um, AMI got acquired by OnSemi, so um, I think that's probably why all the information's vanished. But I'd be quite interested to know just sort of what they are, basically. Lots of stuff in the little tin cans. There's another Actel FPGA, another Spartan. A couple of cans on the back, a few bits of, uh, I wouldn't really call them bodge wires as they're actually uh, marked on the silk screen. They're clearly just shielded interconnects to get sort of a shielded data straight to where it's needed without uh, any noise or anything from other stuff on the board. A shielded box with some sort of, uh, looks like some sort of transmission line thing going on there, but no other really obviously high frequency uh, stuff there. Another AMI chip in there. Can't really identify that chip again. That's sort of clearly attached to one of these sort of bus interface chips. There's an analog multiplexer next to it, so that's maybe an HD or DAC or something. There's a high-speed 12-bit HD in here. Various other odd, odd um, analog bits and pieces, but this is clearly uh, sort of analog input, various sorts on here. And this is the uh, last of the boards in the digital cage. There's um, so sort of VCO tune, so I guess these are VCOs, maybe some frequency generation. There's some ECL dividers here, so these are clearly high frequency, um, pretty high frequency PLL. Um, there's some lattice CPLDs here, and Actel as well. Um, interesting using lattice on here, maybe this was designed by a sort of different group and they preferred lattice. But also, yeah, bear in mind, these are earlier days of PLDs and FPGAs, there may be significant differences between parts, so there may be advantages for certain parts, um, for certain applications. Also you can see the sort of via, via stitched sort of roots around here, so this, yeah, instead of putting coax on the board it looks like they've um, rooted, sort of, they've sort of created sort of um, high frequency roots on the inner layers of the board with sort of via stitching around them so there's quite a lot of those so there's probably some quite a lot of high frequency stuff um, being uh, sort of rooted around so you can see here these sort of going across and there's quite a few of those so there's clearly some high frequency stuff um, going on here there's also quite a lot of filtering on the um, the power input and other of these ubiquitous uh, AMI chips there but so yeah, this will be sort of free, probably sort of frequency generation, I should think. Maybe some frequency counting as well. Here's another thing, say so it's a VCO, VCO tune. So this is clearly a, a sort of voltage controlled oscillator. Uh, moving on to the boards that are in the front part of the cage. Um, this one looks like it's um, dealing with audio. We've got some um, film capacitors here. There's um, an AD637 RMS converter chip. 
Um, the clock's also over here again, a few of these AMI chips, which I'm sure must be to do with um, IOs, some uh, ACD converters. So that's uh, again some um, fairly large inductors filtering on the um, power supply. So I'm sure this will be dealing with the um, audio side of things. There's no label on this board to describe what it is, unfortunately. And this one's labelled TDMA baseband generator, the DTA converter, Altera Flex FPGA, some memory, so that's probably going to be some sort of like a uh, arbitrary waveform generator to generate the various signalling uh, things. A huge great chip on there again. Can't, I, I think um, the that those AMI chips and this one, which has got a different manufacturer name, I think these are in-house Agilent part numbers, the sort of four digits dash four digits. So these are probably either custom or relabeled chips. I'm um, not really sure what that would be because I mean it's probably not an FPGA because all the other FPGAs have just got their standard numbering on. It's got an awful lot of pins. Hard to see uh, where it goes. There's probably at least a six layer board. And there's a 50 to 100 megahertz um, voltage controlled oscillator here. So that's um, going to be a synthesizer for generating um, clock frequencies. And some rather curious labels here. So there's some connectors, presumably for debugging, but oh, I'm interested to know what a uh, brush fuzzy com is for. And there's a, um, a DAC plus some filtering. I wonder if perhaps this is some sort of um, waveform generator chip, sort of um, digital synthesis chip, maybe. And this is another audio processing board, audio there, loads of D2A converters, and on devices, sexy gold package, 12-bit um, high-speed DACs, a few other DACs here, there's a compander, um, quite a lot of analog switching, lots of uh, quite big capacitors, sort of tantalums. This crystal down here, it's got its frequency on a sticky label, which you don't see very often. 13.42177 that's actually a pretty custom cut crystal okay let's get stuck into these um rf modules on the uh, the back plane there are some labels so we've got synth doubler two vector output two doubler one so these are presumably two pairs of identical um modules reference dmod down converter measurement down converter and spare which is uh, unused Um, incidentally, these RF modules are clearly a sort of fairly standard package. I'm sure I've seen sort of packages like this in some other um, Agile and test gear. But of course, they can't just do like one casting to cover all these because they've got internal partitions and so on. There's probably still quite a few different variants. I've noticed on some of these, um, there's sort of some extra marks. I wonder if they've got some like some sort of clever flexible tooling system where they can. Um, actually sort of mould various different varieties of this using a single tool because obviously the tooling for these castings is uh, going to be quite expensive and you're not going to want to make a, one unique one for every single um, board you do so it'd be interesting to know how they um, they deal with that. This one's a reference. There are lots of uh, unpopulated stuff on here. A huge number of these one microfarad film capacitors. Um, not a huge amount, there's still another three of these um, ubiquitous AMI chips. Some HC MOS, a um, couple of analog multiplexers, but not huge. Also, this this is marked Y1, so I'm wondering if that's. Uh, oh, it says 20M, so that's presumably something like a crystal, but it's an unusual package. I don't think I've ever seen a crystal in a uh, TO5 package before. You might have to uh, have a look inside that. I just uh, dremel the corner of this. Interestingly, it's. Um, looks like it's the whole can is copper, which is unusual. Oh yeah, it's just a, uh, just a crystal. I wonder why they chose to put it in a uh, TO5 package, it's quite unusual. I'm not really sure what the deal is with all these film caps, I can only assume it's to produce a super clean and stable supply for this um, oscillator circuit to um, avoid any sort of phase noise and um, other nasties just to produce like a super pure um, stable signal for the, um, all the rest of the RF stuff. So this one is labelled uh, synth doubler and also an. Again this one's got the um, compartmentalised um, can with all these um, sort of springy RF gasket, sort of spiral spring gaskets uh, in the channels. Helpfully the, um, some of the sections on here are actually labelled so VCO, voltage controlled oscillator, 
frac n, so that's going to be the fractional um, divider. So this is obviously a frequency synthesizer. Again, uh, synth supply. And this is actually in that semi um, gate array, uh, data sheets dated 1985. So it's obviously a fairly old, um, old design for that particular part of it. Again, the uh, couple of the, again, there's the uh, ubiquitous AMI chips, the D to A converter. Then there's all these different uh, bits which are labelled with different frequency ranges. So these will look, look like sort of filters. So we've got 250 to 396 megahertz, 396 to 628, 628 to 1000. Uh, the first doubler there. Then 1.6 to 2 gigahertz, 1.26 to 1.6. Then 2 to 2.5, 2.5 to 3.2 and 3.2 to 4 gigahertz. Then there's one of these uh, funky little uh, custom Agilent things which is sort of soldered down. I wonder if that's an output buffer. All right, this one is um, demodulation down converter, D to A converters. And this, this is a um, surface acoustic wave filter. These are sort of electromechanical um, devices designed to produce very precise filter characteristics um, in a sort of mass produced uh, fashion. These, I remember these becoming really popular in the 80s for TVs. Um, earlier TVs, the uh, IF section had lots of adjustments and they were obviously quite um, complicated and expensive to set up. And then these um, soil filters came in and basically yeah, replaced all of that with something which could be sort of manufactured very repeatably. Um, and just you know, the way they manufacture it produces a very precise um, filter characteristic. So those became sort of over a few years pretty much universal in um, TVs and uh, similar applications. Again, there's just lots of, uh, so this is clearly say, uh, demodulation, so this is going to be to do with receiving the signal from the phone and um, turning that back into data for analysis. As an AMD 8600 variable gain wideband amplifier. This presumably is the um, input down here. We've got some of these gallium arsenide switch devices and a little bit of uh, PCB weirdness and some sort of via, heavy via stitching down there and some little uh, PCB filter stuff going on there and this is what's inside that filter what you've basically got is a couple of um, sort of transit it's basically a piezoelectric type device so you've got these um, effectively sort of transducers a transmit and receive transducer at the far ends and just the shape and the way they this is like a photolithographic type process and the way they print these and the characteristics determine the um the filter characteristics and obviously because it's a sort of a lithography type process it's fairly low cost to do in bulk but more importantly it's very repeatable so you get a very well defined characteristics when you, once you've actually um designed it so this one is the um measurement down converter so whereas the previous one was about demodulation and sort of extracting signals, this is probably about just getting uh, measuring power levels accurately. So again, we've got another um, saw filter. Again, more, more of these AMI chips. So there's uh, another filter on the other side. Got a few uh, interesting looking uh, gold chips there. The rest of it looks like sort of fairly bog standard analog stuff. Again, some filtering, and that's probably also um, sort of an IF section. Yeah, interesting, also on this section, we've got some of this um, RF absorber material, and there's actually a piece of it that's been stuck on top of this uh, chip down here. So, obviously, the signal sort of comes in here, some filtery stuff going on here through the IF section, and there's uh, I have signal processing chip there, load of uh, 250 megahertz op amps. Right, so this last one is a vector output. It's probably um, some sort of power amplifier or output buffer type device, sort of screwed down to the case for heat sinking. A couple of uh, analog devices, eight channel uh, DACs here, some um, transistor and diode array package chips there and some uh, 
RF weirdness going on down here. Another uh, these little gold uh, adjunct custom jobbies on that side. Presumably that's the input stage there. So it looks like it goes through there, across there, down and then uh, through this um, output buffer. Take a look. Um, the, some of these power devices sometimes contain beryllium oxide for thermal um, coupling, which is hazardous if it you know, if it's uh, inhaled. So um, you don't want to be dremeling these things. But uh, hopefully we can just crack the lid off and uh, see what's inside. And the area above that um, power amp section's also um, got this big chunk of that RF absorber. So the cover on this thing actually just turned out to be plastic. So that was uh, nice and easy to crack off. So there's a uh, two die in here and a couple of capacitors and a couple of inductors on the left hand side. Let's take a close look at those die under the microscope. So finally let's take a quick look at this um, Vectron oscillator module. Um, I just calibrated my frequency counter against my uh, rubidium standard. Um, so this is measuring the output from the rubidium standard. If I measure the output from that uh, Vectron module, it's extremely close. And it's better than 0.01 ppm after about a two or three minute warm up, which is uh, pretty impressive, especially for something that's sort of fairly old. All right, see if we can get this can open. It's sort of been soldered all around the edge, so I'm just going to try and. Uh, get as much of the solder off as possible then that might be enough just to uh, prise it open because solder is very soft so if there's only a small amount in there then you can usually just pull that apart this is we're having a nice powerful iron uh, like a met coal uh, really comes into its own Okay, so we've got this uh, thermal insulation, not surprisingly. This feels like the sort of stuff they use for putting flowers in. It's sort of a, either that or it's sort of soft foam that's sort of gone hard in its old age. Doesn't seem to want to come out as one piece. See, it's all gone a bit dark, so obviously this thing runs at an elevated temperature for uh, stability. So here we've got um, the transistor here, which is being used as the heater. And this, I'm sure, is a thermistor that's measuring the temperature. And there's um, an LM358 LM dual op amp, so it's pretty fairly simple uh, temperature controller. So this is an aluminium block designed to keep everything at the same temperature. And... Uh, just got the uh, crystal here. I'm not going to bother taking this apart. This is just going to be a crystal. And obviously most of the um, quality in this is yeah, how that crystal is cut and aged and characterised to be um, as consistent as possible. So there's no real point in opening that up. It's just going to be a standard, standard looking crystal. So I'll uh, put this back together because it's a potentially useful little uh, module. So after a sort of brief warm up, this thing uh, ends up pretty stable. It's now pretty much bang on, so within uh, 0.01 ppm of my rubidium reference. So it's uh, got a nice little uh, module. So a uh, crap load of electronics, some uh, very pretty colour coax connectors. It's Bit of a shame really that probably about the only thing that's really usefully recyclable from this thing is this um, oven oscillator module. But uh, yeah, it's got lots of RF goodness in there, but really pretty useless for anything other than its um, original job. But uh, so a few interesting details, interesting variety of FPGA. So there's a uh, Actel, Altera, Lattice, and Xilinx um, devices in there. Obviously the boards are made from a sort of fairly diverse range of um, sources, say different, different countries, different departments. 
quite possible that some of these boards are also used in some other products because you know things like synthesizers and uh, the like are fairly general uh, RF things. 